What are the stories that you have been told? What are the narratives that you are internalizing? Are they really true? Are they really working? There is a romantic proposal from patriarchy and how we could be people of value, of worth in society. For men, there is a narrative about sacrifice, taking the role of the defender, of the warrior, of your community, of your country. Men are craving to prove others and to prove themselves that they are true men. And the military action gives you that opportunity. The invitation is a heroic invitation, but militarized masculinities is poison that uh, dehumanizes men and subordinates and oppresses women. It creates harm. It creates harm for everybody. Militarized masculinity, I want to refer to it as the violent power of men. You have power, how do you use your power? C'est une masculinité où tout est contrôlé. Et quand on utilise l'arme, vous ajoutez à cette masculinité. Societies have just excused militarized masculinity as being part of their society. It's ingrained in society and they've believe that it's something that we cannot get rid of. El ejercicio del poder a través de las armas, el ejercicio de poder a través de lo simbólico que tiene lo militar, detrás de esos héroes de la patria, hay una historia de violencia contra las mujeres. Militarized masculinity, it's all over. It's something we have to deal with globally, but I think that the starting point is essential that it is the complex societies because it is mostly deeply stemmed there. violencia de las fuerzas armadas, policía en las ciudades, ejército también en las ciudades y en otros territorios. Yo lo enunciaría como violencia estatal, que viene de, de décadas, ¿no? Pero es una violencia que viene histórica. Aquí en Colombia llevamos más de ocho días manifestándonos y en estos ocho días por lo menos ha habido 40 muertos que han sido asesinados directamente por la policía. ¿Cómo opera la militarización en nuestras mentes, en nuestra cultura? En Colombia, institucionalmente, a los hombres se les militariza desde muy temprana edad. Toda la propaganda bélica que vemos en televisión, en horario prime time, con estas propagandas en alta definición, con un ejército que invierte miles de millones de pesos al año para que el niño se hace hombre en el ejército. No están viendo hombres cuidadores que están ayudando a víctimas del conflicto, no están viendo hombres docentes, no están viendo hombres enfermeros, lo que están viendo son soldados desde pequeños. Íbamos una vez por allá por mi pueblo, eh, íbamos con, eh, con la que era mi mujer, cogió de la mano cuando pasamos por, eh, pasó una camioneta con unos soldados ahí y nada, pues la, yo miré que así vino como cuando mira así de rejo que, que los miró y como que con esa cara y yo dije, 
le gustaron así como por dentro de mí. Y nada, le dije que yo me iba a ir a prestar servicio, que todo eso, que, que le iba a cumplir la fantasía. Pero sí tenía su cierto atractivo masculino, dijo... <risa> De mí se enamoró un paramilitar con un muy alto mando y me obligó a estar en los grupos paramilitares. En estos grupos armados viví y vi cómo otras mujeres también pasaban por cosas similares. Uno conoce ahí el valor de las mujeres, donde las mujeres son un objeto más un premio más, eh, un incentivo para, para la guerra, para matar. Que los grupos sean legales o ilegales eh, están creados para pelear guerras, para pelear por, por territorios, para pelear por tierras, para pelear por narcotráfico, para defender a, a unas clases que, que quieren poder, que quieren riqueza. Trato de persuadirlo de que, de que hay otras cosas mejores para hacer. De que agote primero cualquier otra cosa antes de eso. Él anhela en su momento estar ahí, pero quizás desconociendo qué implica ser un militar. Perder la humanidad que tiene, exponerse a, a diario a, a que lo asesinen o asesinar a otras personas, a la lluvia, al sol. Ya sabe por qué lo hago también. Es como es algo que me nace y... ¿Dónde está la capacidad mía de haber siquiera incidido en mi hijo para que no fuera parte de ese de ese conflicto, de esa, de esa violencia. ¿Cómo puedo orientarlo a él a que no cometa los errores que, <ríe> que cometí yo o que están cometiendo otras personas? Si no, fue, no fui capaz ni siquiera de, de, de guiarlo para, para que me ayude a construir ese país que, que todos esperamos en algún momento. por ratos como persona y como hombre cometo mis errores pero sin embargo todavía sigo teniendo lo que me dieron en casa mis valores mi ética pero estando ahí uno no tiene ni voz ni mando se puede decir no no voy a hacer eso y si lo van a golpear o algo así uno tiene que puede uno ir a quejarse con alguna con un superior más que uno él va a tomar cartas, para eso hay abogados también, ahorita ya han subido puesto muchas leyes de defensa ante soldados como tal. Pero esa propia defensa nunca va a ir por encima de un poder militar, y eso es una verdad. ¿Cuántos militares han visto que se han rehusado a cumplir las órdenes de los comandantes de, de hacerle daño a una comunidad, de hacer cosas y eso funciona así? Y es la vida suya o es la cara de un, de un régimen que cumple órdenes de un gobierno. Así de sencillo. No sé. No creo. Definitivamente los dispositivos que usa el Estado colombiano, tanto culturales, como institucionales para militarizar las masculinidades de los jóvenes funcionan, tienen ese efecto en los jóvenes. Por eso decimos, ahí está presente la militarización institucional de las masculinidades. La Fundación de Objetores de Conciencia confirmó que el fenómeno de reclutamiento forzado por parte del ejército se está dando en varios lugares de Bogotá y posiblemente del país.
La denuncia del joven interceptado en una estación de Transmilenio no es excepcional. Noticias uno. En estos momentos el ejército está desarrollando una incorporación que es una de las más grandes de los últimos 200 años. Quieren reclutar 81 mil jóvenes para el 2021. A esa cifra no pueden llegar si no es a través de violarle los derechos a los jóvenes en detenciones arbitrarias con fin de reclutamiento. No, 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 no cogió el ejército, el ejército que le dijo a él. Él me llamó, mami, me cogió el ejército. Yo vivo muy cerca del portal del frente que pone el reo. Lo capturaron porque eso para mí es una captura. Una, una pregunta, ¿por qué tienen el documento del muchacho en la mano en estos momentos? No lo pueden detener ustedes, usted, o sea, tiene que haber un comandante que lo detenga, claro. Pero él tiene que hacer Por favor, entrégueselo porque lo que están haciendo es irregular, está en contra de la ley 40. Él tiene que presentarse, claro, presentarse acá uno. Eso que están haciendo es ilegal. No lo pueden llevar, le están violando el derecho. Sí, pero si no lo dejan hablar, ¿cómo va? ¿Cuál es la solución? ¿Cuál es la solución? ¿Cuál es la solución? Puedo hablar con uno por uno. Aquí no la pasa nada. Si ya tiene fundamento, como yo, después que haya fundamento, si hay fundamento para que él no está acá, pues ya no va a salir. Ya, las cosas son como son. Pero por favor, no entremos en choque y no hagan a como atacar. El reclutamiento forzado en Colombia no solo lo hacen la guerrilla, los paramilitares y los grupos al margen de la ley, también lo hace el ejército. Porque en estos momentos hay soldados de todos los distritos militares, de todas las zonas de reclutamiento del país, haciendo reclutamiento forzoso en Colombia. Hay una perspectiva muy conformista de la masculinidad, en la que nos dicen como, tienes que conformarte con lo que la vida te da. Si te dicen que te reclutan, te tienes que reclutar. Escuchar la orden y obedecer la orden. No hay una cuestión de, hey, el hombre también puede quejarse. El hombre también puede decir, no más. No más de inequidad social, no más de militarización. Sí, ese también es, es un hombre. ¿Tú cuál, ¿Cuál es el tipo de hombre que, siente que, que sientes que promueve el ejército? Siento que es un hombre que, como tienen los logos de ellos, eh, patria antes que vida, y lo que yo les dije en la reunión de Copsencia, no puedo aceptar una patria en la cual violan muchos, muchos derechos, en la cual un rico, un, uno, un hijo de un rico en el batallón diciendo no me atraparon. Entonces yo no puedo creer que digan patria antes que vida, sabiendo que la vida uno vale más en una patria que no nos dan los derechos. Aquí estuvimos escuchando jóvenes que prestaron el servicio militar, jóvenes objetores de conciencia y jóvenes que hacen parte de procesos sociales que proponen alternativas al militarismo. Son más los que se suicidan que los que pierden la vida en combate. ¿Por qué creen que eso pasa? Digamos que yo creo que eh, pues el ejército son como muy conservadores en ciertas dinámicas y creo que es porque se dieron cuenta que es como, como una receta que les ha funcionado eh, para que le sigan... Eh, para que logren adoctrinar más gente, si sí, digamos no van a cambiar una, una fórmula que les ha, ha funcionado a ellos, pero ahora esa fórmula como es contraproducente pues para nosotros eh, los pelados que, que se nos obliga eh, pues a cumplir como ese deber con la nación. Se le están metiendo a la mente de una forma violenta, eh, diría yo oscureciendo su, su personalidad, su, su ser y volviéndolo pues, un ser de sangre, eh, una piscina de sangre guerrillera. Están creando es una máquina para, para matar y bueno, y que sale después de que sale del entorno de la guerra. Sí, va a seguir pensando en guerra, va a seguir pensando en pelea, va a seguir pensando en sangre. Y si, y, y si se le está metiendo también esas, esas, esas ideas de, 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 de violar o, o algo así a una mujer, pues va a tener cierto, cierto esquema ahí metido. No digo que, que sea el caso de ustedes, ni mucho menos, pero puede ser así. ¿Mm? crean una figura de masculinidad dentro de nosotros, bueno, que, que replican dentro de la sociedad apenas salen de ahí y de alguna manera se convierten en, en, en personas de resolución de conflictos a través de la violencia y que la violencia termina siendo eh, uno de los pilares fundamentales para eso, ¿no? 
Una de las cosas que busca todo proceso de instrucción militar es suprimir las emociones y la capacidad de sentir empatía por las emociones de otras personas. Esa dificultad para poder negociar con el que piensa distinto, con el que siente distinto. Es la masculinidad hegemónica operando en todo su esplendor. Y esa incapacidad para sentir empatía es lo que nos lleva o lo que nos ha llevado en Colombia a tener uno de los conflictos armados más largos del mundo. Militarized masculinities are protection racket. You're establishing this idea that um, in order to be strong, you need to possess weapons, you need to be willing to use force and violence, you need to um, have the capacity to dominate and oppress others, and that that's where strength comes from. At a personal level, that's what being a real man is, for example, and at the governmental level, that's what it means to be a strong country that is taken seriously in the world. The constructions of masculinity in patriarchal societies are really needed for the maintenance of militarism and of war. Wars and the military uh, systems depend in part on men, on men adopting this notion of masculinity to function, to perpetuate. It's a farce, it's a fallacy, it's purporting violence to be the best solution to violence, which will only beget more violence, um, instead of actually affording protection and security to people, whether that's within a household or within the broader society or internationally. La militarisation, c'est ce que nous voyons presque tous les jours. Nous voyons des hommes en armes, les violences qui se passent. La RDC est entourée par neuf pays où les frontières sont pauvres et les armes entrent. Le problème avec le militarisme dans, dans notre pays, c'est la détention illégale des armes, le conflit où on voit les rebelles et les forces négatives qui viennent avec des armes un peu de partout. Les ressources naturelles, où nous voyons beaucoup de multinationales qui viennent pour rendre ces ressources et qui sont accompagnées euh, des hommes en armes. Les conséquences, ça signifie que depuis des décennies, la RDC n'arrive pas à avoir une paix durable. La RDC n'arrive pas à se développer comme il faut. Nous avons connu une dictature de 32 ans de Mobutu en RDC et cette dictature a été renversée par les armes avec l'arrivée de Kabila le père. C'était une rébellion assez atypique parce que c'était des enfants, des enfants qu'on avait donné des armes. C'est une génération qui a été armée. Donc, L'utilisation des enfants, c'est vraiment la, la, le premier élément de pouvoir banaliser l'arme. L'armée congolaise aujourd'hui est le fruit des de, de brassages de, de plusieurs fractions des rebelles. La police congolaise, c'est aussi un rassemblement des anciens militaires de l'époque Mobutu. Donc c'est vraiment une police très militarisée. Sur la route, vous voyez les convois des autorités qui passent, il y a des armes qui sont là, qui passent. Vous êtes devant les supermarchés, il y a des armes qui sont là. Vous êtes devant un hôpital parce qu'il y a un policier, il y a une arme de guerre qui est là. Devant des stades, devant des endroits où vous ne pouvez même pas trouver l'arme, l'arme est devenue quelque chose de très banalisé dans la ville de Kinshasa, même en RDC. Il y a un grand débat au niveau de la justice parce que les juges militaires disent 
que tant que le policier sera détenteur d'une arme d'assaut, d'une arme de guerre, le policier restera justifiable devant les cours et militaires. La police, comme on l'a jusqu'à présent, tarde à, à être réformée pour que nous puissions avoir réellement une police civile. On a la difficulté d'aller voir quels sont les meilleurs renseignements qu'on donne dans les zones MANA, les budgets qui sont affectés pour les achats d'armes, la détention d'armes. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on fait C'est important de faire des alliances. Cette approche qui voudrait que les hommes et les garçons puissent faire la, la promotion des droits spécifiques des femmes, parce que ça nous donne une différence. Mon engagement vient de par une réflexion personnelle que je, je menais. Nous avons à peu près 52% de la population qui sont féminines. Alors, de par ma réflexion, je, je vois des individus comme étant des talents. Comment nous pouvons mettre en place un système qui essaye de mettre à l'écart 52% des talents de la population et 48% sont obligés de pouvoir répondre aux différents défis euh, auxquels le pays est confronté. Il y a besoin de l'apport de tout le monde. Vous comprenez, à l'époque, ce sont ces hommes qu'on considérait comme nos bourreaux, mais quand vous voyez vos bourreaux qui commencent à venir plaider pour vos, vos droits spécifiques, vous dites peut-être que l'approche sera bonne. C'est là où nous essayons de contrer tout ce qui est masculinité militarisée, de pouvoir aider les femmes pour faire avancer leurs droits. Inequality is at the root of the conflict in Cameroon. People feel excluded, they feel discriminated, and all those frustrations over the years have piled up. Direction le Cameroun, où depuis 1000 jours maintenant, une partie du pays, la partie anglophone de ce pays bilingue, en rouge sur cette carte, connaît une insurrection armée lancée par des groupes sécessionnistes, des groupes qui ambitionnent de créer un nouveau pays, l'Ambazonie. Ces derniers mois, les combats frontaux ont fait place à une... We have the crisis in the north and southwest, in the English-speaking regions of Cameroon. Far north of the country, we have the Boko Haram insurgency, we have the post-electoral crisis, and then we have the refugee crisis in Cameroon. The crisis has now become an open conflict, violent conflict. The militarized masculinities have a negative impact on the community and also on the work for feminist peace. Plus tard, nous voici dans l'autre province anglophone, celle du Nord-Ouest, dernier grand fief de groupes armés séparatistes. We have all of them. Yes, we have some of the news about the situation on the conflict. Why is the government avoiding yeah. open dialogue with real actors? And the chief may be one of those um, actors to be included in okay. a, a dialogue if you want to look for solutions for okay. the crisis. He has witnessed some of these atrocities of this. Uh, I think he has to be one of those actors. If we have a traditional leader like the chief who understands the work of feminist peace, I think it's a very good ally that we can build on. We have tried in other communities to reach out to the chief. No, it's not possible because of the tradition. But he is open to welcome anyone to make change happen. Good afternoon. You're all welcome to the palace. Thank you. Uh, we've been hearing your job, the work you are doing, the preaching for the peace, so we are very happy. My late father was a chief. When we were young, we thought that he was a very hard and a wicked person. The way our father brought us up, 
It's the same thing I saw in the army. All the maturation, everything they were doing to us in the military camp was a normal thing I saw when I was still a child in our palace. When I entered the army, they were very brutal, those soldiers. They enter the bar, they will behave on the way, they beat people, drink, all the money get finished. So when they recruited the young Cameroonians, they thought that that was the behavior of a soldier. They copied those negative behavior. And that's what gave me a negative thought about the soldiers that I wanted to regret why I entered there, but then I was already inside and I continued going with that. Even the chief himself, he is a former gendarme. But the chief feels that if you want to use, use violence or the military response, it should be the last recourse. The chief is promoting dialogue as a solution to conflict. Legitimate violence doesn't exist. The soldier and the gendarme, they have all the powers. If you do something wrong, the only thing is just to arrest you carry you to, to their office for the investigation. There's no need beating on somebody. When you beat on somebody, you become why? You change him, change his mentality. He becomes a rebel. We cannot achieve our results if we don't have people like you. In that regard, you are really looking forward to your support. Because if we do have your support, we are going to be able to have the support of other chiefs, which is very critical because the violence is happening in the communities. The traditional leaders are the custodians of the traditions. They are the representative of communities in charge of ensuring social cohesion and the good functioning of the community. When they speak, they are heard. Once you are a chief, everybody look at you to show the example to his community. What I do is um, trying to see if there are possibility to empower everybody, whether you are a girl or a boy. I always think of them. I want them to, re to succeed in their life. Neutralization has a negative impact as far as uh, the progress of these children here is concerned. The parents of these children are displayed. Some of the parents are dead. They are not going to school. Some of them have been joined the separatists in the bush. I have noticed psychological impact on my peoples. Those who have left the war zone to Melon, they don't really feel at ease. It affects the learning. Those uh, internally displaced peoples, they really pick up from here because they found their base. In this community, it's very different. The chief accommodates the IDPs without knowing where they are coming from. Also, we have noted that in this chieftaincy, they have regular meetings to talk about the issues which are challenging the community. Madam President, I present you my, my palo, okay. where I receive uh, superior chiefs. So you say uh, this is your place and that for? For other chiefs. Okay. All the chairs in this house are thrown. Okay. They're for other chiefs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you men have a seat in, in here? Ah, uh, more for like you. You can receive them here for special cases. Yes. But it's not regular. And if mm -hmm. you receive more like me, where do I sit? If we are the two of us. Yes. You can sit nearer me on okay. the throne here okay. or that way. If okay. there are two of us here, okay. but if there are other phones, you can still sit after all the phones have seated. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything is not perfect with the chief here. The way he speaks, I want to understand whether women's opinion are taken into account. But I'm very curious, Majesty. I'm curious to know in the palace, so many people will come to you for their issues, to have solutions. I'm sure there are yes, conflict resolution mechanisms in the palace. Mm. Just want to know whether in some of these uh, mechanisms, women have a role to play. A very important role, okay. because uh, sometimes men don't understand uh, very well the problems of women. When they say sometimes problem of women, I would like a woman to cheer. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm so happy. To you cheer the meeting. Are, I'm yeah. very happy you are mentioning it because women are going through a lot. And if those uh, mechanisms do not have that in mind, 
that there are some things that women will never speak in front of another man. It will be very difficult. You would think that the problem is managed in the community. Meanwhile, it is not. Because I was very surprised to see that women are also part of these processes, which is very important. Because for other chiefs in other communities, the woman has no role to play. Therefore, it's very important to bring men on board. I have a lot of friends that I always tell them the importance of the women, what women can do. Some understand, some cannot understand, it's natural, but then I always talking to them. In my own little area, I will continue preaching to people, telling the people what Madame Sylvia has been telling, and maybe once in a time, I can gather people, I invite her here to come and preach to them. Now that is open to welcome us and ready to support us to link out to other chiefs, it means that we are going to have impact in different communities. I'm a man of peace and I like freedom, I like liberty. And that's what I'm marking now that she's preaching for that and I appreciate that. Men in position of power have an opportunity to make a difference in how we continue organizing our societies. They are gatekeepers. And I'm not sure if men in position of power have to be only persuaded. It's almost like asking for permission. We have to keep um, strengthening our movements, our social movements for change. By doing so, they will pay a higher price in defending the status quo. Militarization starts from the way you were raised from your family. For a long time in Afghanistan, people have really utilized cultural norms and societal norms in a very, very problematic way to prioritize men and to give men more privileges than women. It starts to make them feel entitled. It starts to make them feel brave and brazen and it really does play a negative role in the ideologies of men. And that's always using the wrong ideologies of religion. It's saying, Islam says that men are the superior gender. Islam says that if you could worship someone else other than your, other than God, and if there was an entity, you could, it would be your husband. But those are not even like, the right interpretations of Islam. Afghanistan is not only affected with societal and cultural issues and teachings, they're also facing poverty, economic crisis, or issues that poses challenges for men to provide. So when they can't provide, they go and take other opportunities that will help them provide. And if that's taking arms for one extremist group or for another warlord, they will do it. I'm gonna pay you 500 hours so you can give your family food for that day. And that's it. It's that simple of a decision. So that's militarized masculinity in Afghanistan. This is the quietest problem has ever been. This time of the night. We are literally at the first gate and they're not letting us in. They're saying that that's, we cannot go through. There's no access. Today it's our fourth attempt to try to evacuate and um, We've had multiple instances where it's been very, very difficult to get to the gate, um, whether it was the TB checkpoint or the American checkpoint. Um, so today we're hoping that we will be successful and that there will be no like harm to our people. Fingers crossed. Um, please pray for us. 
Afghan people were frustrated with how they were being exploited. So we were dealing with a very smart but corrupt government institution. They had a lot of access to militarization and weapons. We were not only dealing with that, we were dealing with warlords and civilians were victims of these kind of like militarization. And I think that's what broke the backbone of Afghanistan. That's what created a vacuum where a militarized regime could come and hijack Afghanistan and take over. And now the new regime we're dealing with, I think we all know exactly how militarized they are. I never thought that the new regime would come and take over the way they did. That is my home. That is everything I've known. That is everything I've, you know, loved. The way Kabul soul died on August 15th, I felt like my soul died with it. Currently, I have evacuated to Norway. It was a very necessary decision to make. I never thought that I would be faced with a decision where I would have to willingly, in order to save my life, choose to leave my country. Our country has been hijacked. And yes, we don't have much control over it, but what we do have control over is what we say, and who we say it to, and how we say it. A dialogue is not always with people that are of similar mentalities. I think it is really crucial that you work alongside men that have very different visions than the stereotype that we you know, see in Afghanistan. Not all men fit the bill of being violent, abusive, and going for militarization. It was totally their uh, freedom all, to all my tribes. I, I never forced my decision on them. Uh, they have a total freedom what to do and where to go. Yeah. Uh, although they are all in our society, it's not easy to uh, give such a freedom to the girls. We're trying to challenge that narrative where men are seen as like the superior gender. And, you know, we're trying to like have a group of male allies that are promoting feminist peace and promoting the rights of women. Um, so we have like our male ulamas, we have our like, you know, uh, human rights defenders that are men, and we have our, for example, parliamentarians, um, like teachers, professors, students, youth, everyone that would, you know, promote the rights of women and support that agenda. Until the people are uh, not um, changing their mentality about the woman, Mm. All about the society as a male mm. against a woman and woman against a man. Mm. It's the mentality of the people mm. uh, and changing the mentality of the people is very difficult. Yeah, it's hard, but I mean, we're working on it still. Sargardani, the stories you have told me, but when you say that the security is good, what do you think about it? Like, شما چه خصم کارتان بهتر میتونن پیش برده بتونن آیا میخواین که همین کارها رو که شما کردین همیشه مطلب دارین که ما شما چه خصم میتونیم که کمک کنیم که همین کارتان بهتر رو شما پیش برده بتونن و بهتر مطلب همین کارتان نتیجه خوبتر داده بتونن بسیار تشکر حریش جان بومای در مدازه که چیزه که شما ازارات کدین در مسوال تان خدا کنه که مقصد جامعه عمل با پشتانه یک we came up with the idea of working and mobilizing the male ulama after witnessing how influential they are in Afghan society. When um, ulama says, 
this is what the Quran says or this is what God said, people start embodying it, trying to apply it into their life. Sometimes I think that didn't even understand how big of a responsibility they had to Afghan society and to educating Afghan men and Afghan women. It was also Afghan women and the lack of knowledge of Afghan women regarding their rights from Islamic perspective. They did not want to discuss with an Afghan woman because they thought that she was not well versed in religion and they thought that this is so inappropriate. And now they're the strongest force we have. They're the force that actually is helping us propel society, even in the current circumstances, when women cannot go out, when women cannot have their education. It is these male ulamas that will be the face of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> These men are showing their solidarity and their support by being the face of our wants, our demands. We have to be a bit more careful. We have to be a bit more cautious of how we approach things, how we do things. And I think that even with all those difficulties and challenges, we still have their support. Afghanistan's had multiple attempts of invasions and each one has been in a militarized manner, which has played a very direct role on how the country functions today. The people feel that militarization is a very normal concept. We've seen it for so long. We've known it for so long and we've been witnessing it for so long that a lot of people think that this is the normal. It's not. This is not normal that, you know, different countries come to your nation and they take over by dropping drones or by helping extremists or neighboring countries or giving them the right funding for ammunitions to be sent and given open access to terrorists. That's what has happened. Afghanistan has been a prey and a victim of this kind of game. Militarized masculinity is structural. It's not just structural in the sense of the one nation we're dealing with. It can be global structures that are highly militarized and passed down to these different countries. When you look at other societies, this is not even a concept. But our country and our people, all they know is which other nation tried invading us. Why is Afghanistan called the graveyard of empires? Do you think that's a great thing to be remembered as? No, it's not. But we were forced to be graveyard of empires. We didn't choose to be. We were forced. We live in a world that's been manufactured by violence, by people who profit from violence. Militarized masculinities are definitely about profits. They're intimately tied to the war economy, literally making a killing off making a killing. There's also the profiteering that goes along with the destabilization of a country that is in conflict. There are people benefiting from this but the majority of the people are not benefiting. It seems very convincing, I have to admit, the idea that through the display of military power, you can protect your people and you can prevent enemies to attack you. But actually this doesn't work. In the short term, yes, sure. You might achieve your, your short term goals in terms of stopping uh, forces uh, and tackling on crime and on terrorists. But uh, in the long term, you are not really addressing the root causes of conflict, of violence. 
we're taught that this is the way the world is, this is sort of the dominant narrative, but it's not actually in reality the, the dominant scene. So what we need to do is dig in, find the examples of, of countries, of societies, communities, households that live differently, and build those up as the norm. What is it that we could actually create instead of the system that we have today? Si de algo hemos aprendido las feministas es, es a estar, a estar en el momento de la confrontación, a, a pensar en que otros mundos son posibles. Todo esto que hacemos, los talleres, los diálogos, los encuentros, las conversaciones con los chicos, con las chicas, incluso nuestra propia experiencia vital que nutre a otras, que inspira a otras y a otros. Eso hace parte del, del ponerle realmente el corazón a esto y decir que, que simplemente no vamos a permitir que, el, que este, estos sistemas opresores sigan dominando nuestras maneras de ser. Eh, nuestras formas en, de, en las que nos relacionamos, el amor, el, el, la, la educación, la salud, la vida, la religión. Creo que, creo que es un basta a todas esas otras formas de opresión y pues para eso hacemos lo que hacemos. Hay que seguir actuando, hay que salir a las calles, hay que ocupar los espacios, hay que hacer juntanzas de, de quienes estamos en oposición a estos sistemas de guerra. Hay que concientizar cada vez más y pedagogizar más de que no es normal, de que no se puede volver sistemático y que esto no es un producto de la cultura.